Hi, everyone. I'm John Lux. I'm the Executive Director of Film Florida. Welcome to Film Florida Friday. Film Florida Fridays are interactive conversations about current topics, initiatives, and relationship building in Florida's screen production industry. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to mention uh, and ask everybody to kind of keep everyone in North Florida in their thoughts. Uh, I don't know if everybody saw, but basically from Pensacola to Jacksonville had some really bad weather overnight into this morning, uh, some tornadoes in, in Tallahassee. So uh, just keep everybody up, all of our friends up north in your, or your thoughts, if you could. Um, today, we're going to have a discussion about the issue of whether someone is an employee or an independent contractor. In a moment, today's guests will introduce themselves, and I'll ask a few questions. During that time, we're going to ask everybody to keep their microphones on mute so we can avoid background noise. After we've gotten through initial questions, we'll open it up to the audience for questions and conversation. At that time, if you could please use the hand raising function on Zoom uh, so we can call on you. We do want this to be conversational and interactive, but we also don't want everybody uh, talking at the same time. We're gonna ask everybody also to keep their questions and comments brief in the interest of time and, and obviously out of the fairness of others. Um, Film Florida Fridays are always free. As you know, we hope that you'll consider donating $20.24 for our 2024 fundraising campaign. That donation link will be posted in the chat box along with other information. Uh, and you can always find the donation tab on our website as well. So with that, let's start uh, with introductions. Our first panelist is John Finnegan. John, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. I'm John Finnegan, as John Locke said. I'm coming to you from my law office in Orlando, Florida. I have my own law firm, Finnegan Law Firm, and I specialize in employment law. I've been practicing 30 years in this area, and my area of practice includes the Department of Labor, uh, wage and hour classification issues, everything we're going to be talking about this morning. It's my pleasure to be on the panel with my fellow panelists and uh, share our information. Excellent. Erin, why don't you go next? Good morning. Um, I'm Erin Medeiros. I'm an attorney with Mearsville and Floyd in Palm Beach County, Florida. We represent unions, hiring calls, and um, union-affiliated benefit funds. I've been working with unions for over 14 years now. A little over 10 of those years has been practicing as an attorney. Um, and just on the point of independent contractor versus employee, my first experience working with a union, I was actually a paralegal in Boston. Um, and my very first, one of my very first cases I helped the attorneys with was um, FedEx One. I don't know how familiar you all are with any of the NLRB cases, um, but it was a case where the um, Boston Teamsters were trying to organize FedEx home delivery at a couple of locations in Massachusetts. Um, ultimately, the Teamsters were successful in um, having the National Labor Relations Board agree that those workers were employees, but a federal circuit court decided that they were really um, independent contractors. So that was actually my first experience working with unions in this area. Um, so that's all that I have. Excellent. And Rebecca, how about you? Good morning, everybody. I am retired from Entertainment Partners, where I was the vice president and thought leader for payroll taxes for 20 years. Prior to that, I was with Deloitte, and my entire career has been focused on employment-related taxes. And of course, the question of whether or not somebody is an employee and, and fully taxable, or if they're an independent contractor and they're going to retain control of their tax situation. And so I worked very closely with major studios uh, all the way down to small independents who would call in and ask questions. Am I doing it right? What's the risk if I do it on the edge of right and wrong? So plenty of experience in the industry and really excited to be here with you and share my thoughts and some fun stories about this issue. Excellent. Well, with that, uh, John, why don't we start with you? Can you just kind of high level give a, a definition of what an employee versus an independent contractor is in the overall sense? John, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> Me too. It, 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 there is not one definition uh, depending on which agency you're working with. Uh, let's start with the fundamental premise that employees are 
attached to an employer. They have an employer-employee relationship. They're a W-2 worker, uh, an employee, and um, that's generally what the government, uh, federal and state enforcement agencies prefer. Uh, the, the lingo that I use when you're an independent contractor, you're a services provider. You're not an employee. You're a W-9 worker. You get a 1099. You provide your services um, as a worker uh, versus an employee. Uh, and depending on which hat you wear, depends on which test and agency you're, you're under. Uh, again, the preference is for the employer-employee relationship uh, because that means those employees are attached to an employer. And now, uh, Becky, given that, uh, I guess, clear as mud explanation, <laughs> how does that relate to our industry specifically when you're talking about an independent contractor versus an employee? So you know, the major studios view it very similarly, um, but uh, the bright line test that they would use, the first, the, the first place they're going to go is what is the creative control? And is there um, creative license to, you know, they're bringing someone on for their creativity. And so the second area that they'll look at is, are you a department head? So if you're a department head, um, they're gonna potentially view that as a independent contractor in the industry, or as we all know it, a loan out, right? You're loaning out your services and those services are so unique that they can't get it anywhere else. And that's what, in essence, in this industry, breaks that idea that, that John F. was talking about. I've got two Johns here. So, so that, that's what breaks that mold out. So the, the way that I explain it to a lot of people is, um, you know, a contractor out there in the real world outside of the entertainment industry is if you're in a business building and you, your company has hired a landscaper to landscape around the outside of the building. They're an independent contractor. They have nothing to do with, with your business and what goes on inside of your business. In the entertainment industry, the business is creation, but they can't go out there and just hire any old landscaper. They've got to find that one true person that can bring the joy to that job that only they can bring. And that's where that that line that that's where that's the best way I have of explaining it to you uh, for our industry. And I, I hope you find that helpful. Yeah. So that being said, there's 50 shades of gray uh, laying out in there. And many times, as John F. mentioned, it goes down to compliance and the level of sophistication of the person that you're working with and hiring because many people are new to our industry. There's been a dramatic number of people that have retired like me and the newer people coming in are, don't have the level of sophistication that someone had of 20 years that um, understands that when they're an independent contractor, they are completely responsible for their own tax compliance and uh, potentially, you know, obviously for their healthcare and all those other things that are provided by that employer-employee relationship. Right. So I'll put a pause button there. Okay. And and Aaron, I mean, generally speaking, from your perspective, what are the most common? What's the most common misconception in the discussion of employee versus independent contractor? Yeah. So I I wouldn't say there's just one common misconception. I I'd say there's at least three. Okay. One of those is um, and I think this has sort of come out a little bit already, but you know, an employer or company thinking that because um a person is an independent contractor under one test, it doesn't mean they're actually an independent contractor under every single federal or state law. Um, so that's one of the misconceptions. Another is um, thinking that just because the company has a contract with someone that says they're an independent contractor, it doesn't mean that they are. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing really gets down to one of the factors of in determining whether someone is an independent contractor or not. And that is whether the employer is actually 
or company is directing the work or not that you are doing as um, an individual working for them. So um, that tends to be, you know, who is setting the hours for you? Is it you? Is it the, you know, employer company? Um, where are you working? Are you able to work wherever you want or are you being directed to show up at a certain location? Um, who's in charge of determining when you take breaks? If you work beyond, you know, the time that you want to work, we can call that overtime. Um, and then I think Becky was touching on this a little bit about your industry, but the details as to, you know, how you are actually doing your work and what you're doing, who's determining, um, you know, how you're actually doing it. Um, yeah. So those are really the the three, I think, um, most common misconceptions and sort of different areas of what we're talking about here. That, that Well, that's really good. And that leads into the next question. John, you know, Aaron mentioned a couple of those questions that are, you know, if this, then you are that, and if this, then you're not and all that. But there are a number of those questions. What if some of them have the checkbox, which would lead you to say, well, this person is an employee, but some of them are not leading to you as, as an employee. So what, what happens then? John, there's, there's, four or five agencies that regulate this. And Becky, if you want to pull your slide up, you can share that because I, I think that'll illustrate uh, the question. Uh, but to your, your question, John, there's no one defining question. Uh, it's just not that simple. Um, and it's like with the Department of Labor test, there, there's six items on their test. And so if you check the box on four and you don't check it on two, that doesn't mean that you, you determine definitively that the person's an employee versus an independent contractor. Um, Becky, why don't you take- uh, Sure. Our, so, our so, you can, so you can see that from this chart, um, the IRS is, is, is off, uh, looks at behavioral control, financial control, and the type of relationship. Um, and so if you're under an IRS audit, this column, that is all that they're gonna look at. They're not gonna look at any other um, standard out there. There is a form that you can take a look at uh, called an SS20, uh, I, uh, I think it's an SS20 that the IRS publish, publish, publishes um, and you can take a look at that and and there's like uh, three pages of questions on it, just as John F was 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 mentioning. And then the ABC test is um, the one that most state agencies use for state unemployment insurance taxes and state income tax um, enforcement. And so they're looking for the absolute absence of control for uh, the company has no control over when you show up or how you're going to do the work. The um, the business is unusual or away from the, the, the place of employment. And the person is normally a, an independent contractor. And just as, as John and Aaron mentioned, this is not a um, one and done. Oh, I meet absence of control. I stop there. So all of these columns are cascading. And, and so that means that if you, if you are, are um, under financial control, you meet the first three, but you don't meet anything under behavioral control, that's where you'll hear all of us with that hesitation in our voice because it's an accumulation of, of positives and negatives that the agency that's auditing will look at to make that determination. And then the DOL right now has proposed regulations, uh, but the current DOL really looks at the economic reality of the situation. And when you think about economic reality under the, the DOL and the IRS, you're thinking, you need to be thinking, what financial investment have I made as a business person into my business that makes uh, me have a profit or a loss if I do the work for this company and they don't pay me. So the real question in our industry sometimes boils down to, 
if I don't get paid, if the only thing that I lose financially is the paycheck, then I'm probably not an independent contractor. If I have invested in equipment, invested in things that I have to pay and bills that I have to pay, uh, and if I don't get paid, those bills are related to my work, not my mortgage and my car payment. So that financial reality test um, is what a lot of that economic reality test is what a lot of agencies, and I've been through a lot of audits, that's, that's, that's where they'll pivot and they'll say, nope, they had no financial investment that they could show us. Okay. Okay. And uh, now Becky, uh, someone in the chat asked, is this document available somewhere? Is that, is this public, uh, you know, available to the public? So, so thank you for asking. And I'm happy to share it with you, John, so that you can post it. The weird thing about this document is that very top line. I, I'm a, um, a member of, uh, of pay, payroll organization that used to be known as the American Payroll Organization. They just rebranded as payo, payroll.org. And they publish um, tremendous books that uh, keep all of us uh, abreast of the regulations. And that book is called The Payroll Source. And you can see that first line up there. You'll see that word source, source, and then you'll see the 2022 payroll source. That's okay. their book. So okay. <laughs> it's a little funky. So, so um, but the, the reason they used their book up here is because it's like every state agency uses the, the ABC test almost to a fault. So when you're looking at it, just know that that 2022 payroll source pages, that's nobody's going to be able to go back and research those. Um, they'll have to go to the actual DOL websites. But uh, there is one, one column missing from here. And Aaron... Uh, I'm going to ask that you kind of walk us through that the column that's missing. Sure. So um, one of the important columns that's missing from my perspective as a union attorney is the National La Labor Relations Board. Um, there was a case last year that's called um, something like Atlanta, Atlanta Opera. Um, so that has... The, the current makeup of the NLRB has changed since um, the Biden administration took over. And so there's a new standard under the National Labor Relations Board that's um, more lenient, I think, than the ABC test, maybe even the IRS test. Um, and I haven't done a full analysis of the new final rule with DOL because um, it just came out recently. Um, but it but it is a test that's more lenient. So um, if you're interested in unionizing, you can always talk about, to a union about what that test is. But know that that is a more lenient test than it used to be. OK, so I think uh, we're going to try to get this chart. Uh, I don't know that we'll have it to drop into the chat box today. But when we post this next week on our YouTube channel or uh, on social media, we'll try and have a link to something uh, that you can get this. But in the meantime, we're going to leave it up for another minute or so. Take a picture of it so you have it uh, in front of you. Um, and, but I'm going to leave it up while, uh, while Becky, I ask you kind of the next question. Um, does, in, in, you know, when you're talking about different things that determine, you know, whether, you um, uh, someone is an independent contractor, does the nature of our industry, in your opinion, make it easier or harder to determine whether someone is an employee or, or an independent contractor? Um, I, I think it actually makes it a little bit easier because we have, we've had independent contractors in the form of loan outs, you know, for years. And so we all get it. Uh, I think the challenge is that the, the regulatory landscape is changing. Uh, just as the new uh, Aaron mentioned, the new NR NLR and <laughs> the new regs she's talking about uh, uh, on the National Labor Relations Board has changed, and of course we see the DOL changing. And guess what? You know, in 2025, if there's a a, a change in the White House, then there could be a change again. And so we'd all love to have a standard that sticks. But there is there are so many agencies that are involved in this question, and there's so many new ways of working, and those new regulations are going to come for the gig economy. 
And so we're going to have to constantly make those adjustments. And all that being said, I, I have to share the, the best story I have from Entertainment Partners. Uh, if you all remember the show Lost filmed in Hawaii, and Hawaii uses the ABC test, and Lost high, wanted to, to film in a particular area that um, was a private property, and there was a chain link fence around it, and there was somebody that had a key to that property that needed to, um, that they, that was hired by the owners as the property manager. And that person's job was to unlock the gate at seven o'clock in the morning, let everybody in, lock the gate again. And then whenever they were done shooting, come back, unlock the gate, everybody's out and lock it back up. And this person did this for five days in a row and was paid $350 to do it. Say in the chat, if you think they're an employee or an independent contractor, <laughs> they invoiced for thirty for $350 flat fee. There was a contract. So I'm looking at the chat. Hang on, I'll check check the chat. Yeah, employee, independent contractor, employee. <laughs> well, they paid the 350 through accounts payable. And sure enough, this person went down and and um, applied for unemployment for the state of Hawaii and wanted the $350 included in their wages so their employment would be incrementally a little bit higher. And that's when I got involved. And when I talked to the state of Hawaii, they're like, you're never going to win this. We're and I said, you know, a week, this is classic independent contractor, classic. It's just like pretty much clear, uh, no time card, no, you know, you know, the whole went through the whole thing. Nope, nope, nope. And we did uh, go ahead and pay the entertainment partners. If you, the, you know them, we, we, in the background, you don't know what we'll do for a client, but literally for lost, we went in. Uh, filed amended returns, added them to the state unemployment, paid the FICA, Social Security and Medicare, this S SDI in Hawaii, paid everything and reclassified them and gave that guy a W-2. Guess who called me all hacked off that they got a W-2? The guy. Later. Yeah. Word. Mm -hmm. So not someone sophisticated in our industry, not understanding, um, just knew he was trying to get as much unemployment as he could, scraping right. money most likely. And there you have it. So mm. it's a really, uh, it is not an industry that is as cut and dried um, anymore um, because a lot of newer people are coming in and because the regulatory landscape in all areas is is fluid. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I was going to ask that question. Does the length of employment have anything to do with it? Because a lot of a lot of people in our industry work half days, one days on on a, a shoot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, exact opposite situation. State of Georgia, a, a production had a um, food dresser, and she worked a couple of days a week uh, on this production for sixteen weeks, two days a week, one day a week, sixteen weeks. And was um, was paid as an independent contractor, and then a production ended. This is the first time she worked in our industry. Production ends. What does she do? Goes to Georgia, files for unemployment. She had been. Turns out she had been working other places. Um, so she had some W two. She also had other ten ninety nine. And we took that one to the wall and won. Uh, she is an independent contractor. Um, so all the way, and this was a major studio, all the way, all the hearings, unemployment hearings, Georgia, not ever, California would have been like, oh, you're an employee, it's over. Georgia said independent contractor. Comes back to, of course, nobody's bitter, you know. So she goes back to the show when hiatus is over and fills out the paperwork to be an employee. And they called me and they're like, hey, can we make her an employee? I'm like, no, <laughs> you can't now. She's, and she obviously just didn't get it. But in her mind, um, you know, she wanted to be able to collect unemployment between, while on hiatus. And so it's, it, it depends. So the other 
thing that we haven't talked about yet is it depends on the state too. Mm -hmm. I was and just going to ask a that. Lot of times, a lot of times for those of you that do employ people, where you're going to get caught is at that they don't understand that they, they that as an independent contractor, they don't get unemployment. And worse, if it's a, a state disability state, they'll come after you for state disability. Worse, you think it's over. Once the state has finalized the audit and completed everything and you're breathing a sigh of relief, they give that information to the IRS. And the IRS doesn't even give you the courtesy of an audit. It just says, ah, we agree with mm -hmm. California. You're an employee. Your person was an employee. And here's the penalty and interest, social security, and federal unemployment and um, personal income tax withholding that you should have done. Uh, and here's the bill, thanks so much. So it's it's brutal. So John, I mean, some of this is, is obvious, but I mean, like for those that don't really fully understand, like why would someone, uh, why, from an employer standpoint, why would they want someone to be an employee versus an independent contractor or vice versa? Can you kind of give us from the employer standpoint? Um, I think it depends, John, on the employer and the size, the sophistication, and, and how much have they thought through this. Um, I go back to what I said earlier of it's either one or the other. You're either right or wrong. And Becky shared some great stories about bad outcomes. Uh, so, so if you want to sleep well at night, the, I go back to that the preference would be an employer-employee relationship to avoid all the risk and the unknowns of an independent contractor. Um, that's the simplest way to do it, but if that's not the industry and that's not the norm, and, and and the preference still is, well, we can have independent contractors, you have to be able to answer the question, should you get challenged on it and audited on it, can you pass the test? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we've talked about the five tests. You have the Department of Labor, which goes to minimum wage and overtime. You have the ABC tests that go to unemployment and work comp status. You have the IRS test that goes to payroll withholdings. And then as Aaron brought in, you have the NLRB test. Are these workers employees that can be unionized? Uh, so those those don't all meld. Right. It, it all depends on, on which, which one you're drawing the problem from. And is it going to get challenged by an agency or is it going to get challenged by a worker? Um, so there's a lot of unknowns. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now, Aaron, does it matter if someone wants to be an independent contractor? I mean, I can talk from my own experience and when I was with an, a previous company um, where we felt that someone was an employee because of A, B, and C. But they insisted that they did not want to be an employee. They liked the freedom of being able to say, no, I don't want to work and, and uh, you know, have the ability to work for other, you know, companies and those type of things. Does that matter? So with my line of work, I've never had anyone come to me saying they wanted to be an independent contractor, but I do believe okay. that exists. Um, John, just I'm going to answer that, but just so that I'm I, I clarify what I was talking about before with the Atlanta Opera case. Um, I keep talking from the union side, so I sort of made an assumption and didn't finish my thought on that that people would follow. But when I was talking about the new um, standard for the NLRB B being more lenient, what I was really meaning is that it's more likely now with the new standard that you would be considered an employee than what the past standard was for the NLRB. So I just wanna make that clear. Okay, but to good. actually answer the question you just asked, John, um, it, it doesn't matter if you um, have signed a contract or wanna be an independent contractor, if 
you're an employee or if you're the employer and you want that. Um, it is one of the factors. You know, we keep talking about all these factors. It is one of those factors that'll be considered, um, but it's not the determining factor. Um, the Every single agency is going to look at basically the totality of the circumstances or if it's really the ABC test. Um, you know, that, that'll be looked at just at certain things. And if you meet two, but not others, you know, so it is one of the factors, but it's not necessarily the determining one. Okay. Okay. Um, not in my world, if the independent contractor themselves are incorporated and it's a business to business relationship, uh, to me, that's significant. Uh, and, and I don't know if that's, in the film industry or not, but in, in just general private practice, uh, um, if, if that landscape or that Becky reference that mows the lawn at the employer building, if they're their own business and they sell their services and they invoice for their services, uh, then, then that's a business to business relationship. And I think it is a good indicator of an independent contractor relationship that they don't just perform their services for one company, the, it's whoever wants their services and, and they're incorporated themselves. Okay, okay, good. Um, so I, uh, Becky, thank you very much for sending me that document. So everybody, uh, Becky's document uh, is now in the chat box, it's a PDF. And for those that will be watching this uh, after the fact on our one of our recording, There'll be a link in the, uh, the, the details of the, the video uh, where you can get uh, that document. So good. Okay, so uh, we got just a couple more of our main questions and then we will uh, open it up to uh, all the questions. we got a couple in the chat box, a couple we got a, a hand raised already. So we'll get going. Uh, Rebecca, can you talk about this issue from a union versus non-union lens when, with, a, with a, uh, our industry in mind? I was really glad to see this question because um, I, I know we have a very sophisticated union audience here. And when the unions speak to me about this issue, their number one concern is that someone is treated as an employee. They want the person to have the benefits of that employee employer relationship. They want that very high level workers comp coverage for their workers, they want social security and Medicare paid in for their workers, and they want their workers to be paid properly for all the hours that they work, uh, especially those over and above either 40 hour in a week or eight in a day in California and Alaska. So, um, so the, the conversations are always very critically around that. There, for, for the majority, there are some unions out there that are struggling with this concept, and one of them um, I have a good friend that's an editor, and um, editors seem to in the in the new world he, he seem to be falling into a kind of a gray area, but but for the most part, um, most unions are are very much strongly strongly going to um, even require in almost all cases require that their um, that their workers be paid as an employee. And there have been times when the unions called me and said, can you talk to this person? Because they keep insisting, even to the union, they're an independent contractor. And we do not want, want that. We, we do not want that. So um, that being said, I think that the smaller productions are so budget sensitive that there are um, a tremendous amount of times where someone, especially newer in the industry, will think, OK, I'll, I'll go ahead and work a non-union, uh, small independent they'll be paid on a 1099, all their other work is on a W-2. Guess who gets audited? The, the employee gets audited. And then um, their response, they're, 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 um, as an employee for all of the, the extra things that they did for that 1099 where they wanted to be able to write off those investments that they made, they can't. Mm. They're reclassified and um, and of course, the small production's long gone. The, the IRS can't go after them. Uh, so it is very problematic for you as an individual to file your 1040 with the IRS or a state agency with both W-2s and 1099s. And to explain that 
if you get caught in an audit and the difference between the two, if, if the function of what you were doing was exactly the same for the 1099 and the W-2. That is, that is fascinating. I actually never thought about the combination of the two. That's, that's a really great point. Um, and now, Aaron, I, I think we already answered this question, but I'm just going to ask it just to make sure that we have clarification, uh, you know, uh, do commonly used independent contractor agreements insulate an employer from liability? I think the answer is no, right? If it's found that they these people are acting as employees, whether or not the, the person signed an independent contractor agreement doesn't matter. Is that correct? Right. So, I mean, if you're legitimately an independent contractor, then, you know, it's going to shield, obviously, the company from having to pay whatever it owes for workers comp as far as what's required every month or quarter or whatever into um, that program on employment, uh, tax, payroll taxes, um, you know, paying according to minimum wage and overtime laws. Um, they wouldn't have to pay health insurance and a number of other benefits. So, um, they also want to be subject to employment discrimination laws if you're not an employee. If you are rightfully an independent contractor, then, um, you know, there's also potential for um, the company to be shielded for any sort of tort that you might commit where you in injure another individual. Um, and so, you know, there are protections if you are truly an independent contractor for that employer. But if you have that contract and it's found that you're an employee, then that contract's not going to shield the employer from any fines from, you know, the IRS or um, any other agency, um, you know, and potentially I think under, I think Becky could talk about this, but I think for taxes too, it's also can be seen as a, a felony um, if you are misclassifying someone as an employee that's really an independent contractor. Yeah, okay. And uh, John, I think we we mentioned this earlier, but I, again, I just wanna clarify, uh, talk about how the administration in the White House impacts this every potentially four or eight years. It does. I mean, and and Aaron and Becky both mentioned this, it, yeah. the pendulum swings depending on the uh, pro-business or pro-worker uh, administration. So it, um, it does change and it creates uncertainty. Yeah, okay. Uh, unfortunately. Um, and that puts the onus on employers to get it right, uh, but it changes from administration to administration. Yeah, okay. So we, we have a couple more questions uh, that we had planned, but I, we, we have a lot of questions in the chat and a couple of hands already raised. So we're gonna get to those. Uh, and then if we have time, we'll circle back to our, our, our scripted questions. If you put a question in the chat, I'm gonna do my best to get to it, but there's been a lot of comments and a lot of posts. So uh, your safest way, if you put a question in the chat, please still raise your hand and ask your question um, because that's the, the, the best way to make sure you're gonna get called on. So uh, Nicole, we're gonna call on you first. If you wanna unmute yourself, I'm gonna add a spotlight so you can come down so people can see and go ahead and ask your question. Oh. Um, I typed it out, but I'm going to read what I typed. Okay. So um, with regard to the cruise lines and the verbiage that they use in contracting individuals for entertainment, stagecraft, and non-union work, uh, if there is wording in the contract that states the amount of compensation is theirs to set, the hours are theirs to set, usually it's a 40 plus a week, that the person contracted cannot discuss the hours or compensation being given with other employees. They set the location of the work done. The person contracted then needs to also keep documents like receipts for any transportation, um, materials, hotel costs, and then they can invoice that uh, those items uh, and then are reimbursed at a given time. Uh, the individual is then noted on the contract as an, an independent contractor and responsible for their own insurance, but only if they're working on board a ship and not at a local office. 
Uh, would this truly be an independent contractor work or W-2 work? And if it's not the former, is it legal for a business to create this contract with individuals under these, under these, um, under the previous, you know, information that I had just put, you know, pointed out under those bullet points? All right, that was a lot. Anybody catch that on what, the, how to respond to that part? So the, uh, the non-lawyer will jump in. And, and this is what I always tell people. Um, you cannot contract away the employer-employee relationship. So nice to have a contract, but if the law, wherever they sign the contract, or it could be the law of the sea, there could be, um, there's you know a whole different world out there in the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, and so it could be that this is allowed in, in that world. But if the IRS looked at it, the DOL and the and uh, and and other state agencies looked at it, they would strictly look at their laws and they would look at the contract and say, that's nice, but you can't contract away the law of uh, the jurisdiction that that, that work falls under. Um, so it's not a direct answer, but I'm gonna I'm gonna let Aaron and John uh, talk more uh, about the more legal answer. Yeah, my hesitation in answering was, was what part is on the scenes that might be different from, you know, what I know. Um, so I don't know what the, the laws of that would be. Um, but just to add in, it, it, if, if someone who signs that, you know, is really an employee, employees have a protected right under the National Labor Relations Act um, to communicate about wages, hours, and terms and conditions of employment. So um, that's something that when you were you know, reading out that I heard that my, you know, my ears perked that I was concerned about because, um, you know, it, I think it's tough for us to under just that language without asking more questions um, that we're able to, you know, give you an answer one way or another on that. Um, but if you are that, that is a concern. If you are actually an employee, that's a concern I have too, that they're trying to, you know, silence people who may be employees that have a right to talk about wages, yeah. hours, and terms and conditions of employment. And Nicole, what I would want to see in that contract is what law governs it. Uh, you know, usually in those contracts, they do at the end where the boilerplate language is, it says, this contract is governed under what law? And they, and they don't, they don't put that. In fact, um, the things that you have pointed out, Aaron and John, is um, I did uh, respond to a contract that was um, uh, I was being uh, um, courted, if you will, to join up with a, uh, a cruise line. And after reading upon all of these articles that they had, I did have a couple questions that I did follow up with them in the legality. Uh, if I was as an employee, the legality of not being able to discuss um, wages and hours set uh, with other employees. And I noted what that legality was. And even though that they are, uh, I would say worldwide, they, they, they operate everywhere. I think within the United States, uh, they are bound to some of these legal laws based on uh, the labor laws, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, and then also just with regards to the, the terminology, is the person truly an employee or are they ended up in a contractor? And at the end of that communication, I was told I was not a good fit. Right. And, and I think that's a good point to what we're talking about today. If you're, you know, whether you're rightly classified or not as an employee or independent contractor, and you think it should be one thing or the other, and then you go to the company and say, I really think that I'm this, you could have exactly that problem Nicole has. So, um, you know, with that, I would suggest that, you know, you talk to attorneys, you talk to a union, you talk to, um, you know, whoever you you can to get more information and advice, um, potentially before you go to the company and ask those kind of questions, because um, the result might be exactly, you know, what Nicole faced for that, right. that contract work, job, right. whatever. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, Nicole. Uh, Earl, we are going to bring you down and add your spotlight. And uh, again, uh, while he's here, we want to thank Earl for being so uh, forceful 
politely forceful in you getting this topic uh, on Film Florida Friday because this is something Earl feels passionate about and so we are glad we were able to pull it off. So Earl, go ahead and ask your question. Well, thanks. Oh, good morning, everyone. Thanks, uh, John, and thanks to the panel for 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 doing this. And as John said, I I've been bugging him for a while to uh, to do it. I, and I want to, you know, we've talked a lot of legalese this morning. You know, a lot of things that that I, you know, a lot of people probably are are, you know, don't understand because a lot of legal speak. Let's just put it in in a bread and butter sense. Florida does not have a lot of, you know, productions that are uh, like movies and television. We used to. So a lot of our work is commercials and uh, small indie features. And a large majority of them are still classifying uh, film crew like myself as independent contractors. The way that happens, normally you get a call, Earl, you want to work on a commercial next week? Sure. Here's what we're going to pay. Blah, blah, blah. At that point, there's no discussion about whether it's going to be a, uh, I'm going to be a contractor or an employee at that point. You don't find that out till you show up the morning, by the way, and then you get a call sheet saying, Earl, I want you at Crandon Park in Miami at 7 a.m. So they're telling me what time to be there. Uh, you get there at 7 a.m. and they hand you a form. You fill out a form saying that, you're providing your services as an independent contractor on this commercial. Uh, you, you, pretty much everybody signs it because uh, I guess, and I'm going to ask that question, what happens if you don't sign it? They'll probably say, well, you know, you should probably go home. You can't work. But everybody signs it because it's a small film community. All the producers know each other in, in town. So it happens a lot. So you sign it, they say, okay, we'll start working seven o'clock. Uh, and then around uh, one o'clock they said, hey, everybody, we're going to lunch, we're breaking. Uh, and then around 6 p.m., hey, everybody, we're going home and we're gonna come back at seven o'clock the next day. Unlike like a roofer, if I have a roof leak, I call the roofer, hey, can you come fix my roof? I don't have any say about what time he shows up to fix my roof. He shows up when he wants because he, in fact, is a contractor and I hired him to fix my roof. So does not the the mere fact that they're telling me when to report, when to break, when to leave, make me an employee? Or is that not, in fact, true? So it, it doesn't necessarily mean you are an employee for those things I would there because they're of the different factors and you have to consider everything I would want to know more in order to make that determination for you to me those are very important things and so um you know I, I would start thinking from what you've told me oh it does sound like he's an employee but I would still need to know more so one thing that they look at too is how often are you working for this company? So is it a one-time deal or are you doing commercials with them? You know, I don't know. I don't really know the industry that well, honestly. You know, are you doing commercials with that particular company um, five times in a month or is it just once a year? That's something else I look at too. And then are you being paid by the hour or are you being paid, um, you know, for the actual project? So those are a couple more things. And then are you providing, are you bringing your own tools? Um, are those tools being provided for you? Um, those, those are some additional factors they look at. They also look at, um, you know, what you're doing is that for, is what you're doing um, principal to what the business does so are you just showing up for example to a movie theater to shoot and you're working directly for the movie theater just to shoot a commercial for them that'll air about their movie theater their line of work is to have people come in and watch movies it's not to make you know make um ads for tv or anything like that so um you know what is the company that's actually contracting with you doing um, is one of those factors as well. And I mean, if it's helpful, we could actually go through these factors because I know we keep talking about it, like you said, at a, at a high level, 
um, but we could let you know sort of more about what the general factors are and, and then you can just know you're not going to get the same result from every single agency and you, um, the factors might not be exactly the same for each agency either. So, so obviously the reason, and, and I think the, the, one of the panelists mentioned, what's the reason that I think the main reason that the people classify film crew as independent contractors, because it's a lot less expensive to do so uh, versus uh, classifying them as an em employee, correct? It is until they're caught, and then right. it would be very right. expensive. <laughs> right. It That's will correct. the penalties, interest, taxes are equal to the in many cases to the amount that you originally paid. So right. Ernie, you bring you bring up such a great point. Um, it is it is easy with that peer pressure and the desire strong desire to work and to to, to maintain your status as a creative. Um, so, you know, once you show up, you're, you're kind of in a bind and it's just a fabulous example. Thank you for sharing. It. Well, Earl, let's, let's kind of answer some of these questions that Aaron uh, asked as kind of rapid fire. So let's get real, just real quick. Um, do you bring your own equipment and, or tools when you work? You bring a simple belt with hand, with hand tools, as far as the lighting equipment, the, the big, the cameras are provided by the production. The lighting is provided by the production. The trucks that carry that stuff is provided by production. I f simply bring a screwdriver, a knife, and a wrench. Okay. Pretty much okay. to operate those tools that are provided by the company. Okay. Uh, the, the question about, and I know like you work for a lot of people. So let's just for this example, let's answer the question hypothetically. Is this a, a, a production company that you work with five times in a month or five times in a year? I would say most of the commercial companies, uh, as you know, I do mostly episodic and motion picture. So my commercial uh, realm is, is not as much as others. Some only do commercials, but but I would say it's a handful of times per year per company. Okay. And the, the question about is this, the, the task that you are performing, is it pertinent to what this company does overall? The answer to that is yes, because you, you are hired by companies that do production. Right. And I am yeah. paid. There was another question about how pay, um, it is by the hour, not, okay. not, a, not a fee to provide, not, you know, well, we're going to pay Earl uh, uh, $800 and, you know, he was just, you know, for forever long, he's going to get eight hundred dollars. Usually by the hour, it always you, is by the hour. It, it's by the hour, but there are some day rates. But within that day rate, it is agreed that you will only work a ten-hour day, right? Yes, and if and it's stipulated if you go over ten, this is how much we're going to pay you. If you go over twelve, this is how much we're going to pay you. That happens in the in the uh, independent contractor realm and the uh, employee realm. Pretty much, okay. that's standard no matter how they're classifying you as far as you're going to get paid a certain rate per hour and you're going to get a certain amount per for overtime it may differ okay. job to job okay so aaron it, it, did we answer the questions for this specific question do you have can you could you give a, an answer whether you think this is an employee or an independent contractor I, I think i have one more question so when you're actually shooting is there someone directing you as to where to shoot and Absol how? Absol absolutely. Right, there's, there's a director. Yep. yep. So there's I mean, a director, there's a producer, there's this, a cinematographer. Yep. So, I mean, this is, you know, we're, we're talking about this in, I don't know, five minutes, just, you know, straight off of whatever. To me, it, it, it sounds like you might be an employee. I, I can't under these circumstances say, oh yes, you definitely are. But to me, it sounds like you know, you potentially are an employee under those circumstances. I don't so, know if John thinks differently, but, you know, obviously we're just sort of doing this on the fly right now, so we can't give so up. I'll, 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 I'll let others answer their, I mean, ask their questions, but just one final thing. So as a crew person, myself or anybody, what can a crew person do when they are, a conf what do you do? I mean, are your hands tied? Without ratting out the company, what can you do? All right. Thank you. Is, or I'm going to take the spotlight off of you, Earl, so let the panelists answer that, and then we'll get to our next question. Thanks, Earl. 
So uh, what do you do? So here's what I would do, um, just in the nature of the world that you're living in, Earl. I would keep every darn bit of documentation you possibly, possibly can. And there will be a moment in time when that documentation is needed uh, for whatever reason, because ratting them, you can rat them out and then you may never work again. So we want to, you know, we, I holistically, I understand potentially the challenges that you're facing, but I think the critical thing to make you feel good is documentation on every single show, keep a spreadsheet, keep a receipts, show everything. And then, and then the other thing you could do, it's kind of subtle, but you can set, you can ask the question when you get hired, um, what happens if I get injured? What kind of coverage do you have for a workers' comp related injury? Um, because that's often a way for them to go back and take a look at their insurance and their coverage and their coverage provider. It's weird how all those things are interacted. Their workers' comp coverage provider may come back to them and say, you know, this is too dangerous to continue to pay these people this way. You've got to have them covered a little bit stronger um, for, for a workers' comp coverage. And, and that's a subtle way of getting them to dig a little deeper into the liability that the risk that they're taking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and, and I would just say oh, to talk to an IAT local and see if they can help. Yeah. Well, and the other thing, I mean, to what we talked about earlier, that puts Earl in a tough predicament because we've already talked about how as, as a uh, employee slash independent contractor, he's most likely doing his taxes based on being an employee a lot of times, but now all of a sudden he's doing a handful of jobs as an independent contractor, and that's going to flag him with the IRS, which makes his life much more difficult too. So. Earl, are they giving you a 1099? Yes, yes. You okay. get 1099 from all those jobs, yes. Okay. And do there, is there a, um, are you getting any box rental? Only on the uh, motion picture, uh, which is payroll. Okay, okay. Yep. All right. So the 1099 that you're getting from the- From the labor um, for, the com for those commercials, yes. Right, and that's going to be an N that's going to be an NEC, non-employee compensation document. Um versus the box rental is now on a separate 1099 miscellaneous. So those um, so those are the two documents. Keep a hold of both of those two because that NEC is literally, they're saying to the IRS that this was non-employee compensation. And, um, and the, the fact pattern that you've shared leans toward employee. So that's, there's, it's baby steps in this industry sometimes, especially for commercials and indies, but um, eventually your documentation may be asked for. Okay. All right. Uh, Rose, you are up. So go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, I asked my question earlier. So I'm, I'm a casting director. So my business is mainly done just as you see it, me and my computer. Um, sometimes I hire assistants. Um, I've, I'm incorporated. I've always um, taken 1099s. And um, yeah, I mean, some of my buddies have, you know, the episodic gals are uh, part of the Teamsters in California. Um, we don't have that. I mean, I work in California. I work, you know, I'm in Florida, but now we work everywhere. Anyway, um, point is, I'm pretty sure I'm always been an independent contractor. I don't think, but something you said earlier, and I have the first time in a million years of in doing business, I have clients not paying me. Pardon my hand gesture. I don't know what I did <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, and so, but something you said was, you know, like I have a particularly on one client that's not paying um, I, I had, I had the expense of an assistant that they asked for and still they didn't pay me any of it, including my assistant, let alone, you know, you know, anyway, but, um, so is there some remediation to do? I, I mean, I think I'm right that I'm not an employee, 
but it was like I said, what you said about the expenses and my expenses, my computers, it used to be cameras and, and locate, you know, like that, because we had in person, but we really don't anymore. Um, anyway, I, I think you get my question. I kind of walked around it. Um, but you know, like what? <laughs> Um, just so I make sure I understand, are you asking if you're an independent contractor or employee, or are you asking what do you do because you're not getting paid? Both, okay. actually. I, I, I'd i like to be a little clear, uh, since this is what we're talking about, is the independent employee um, versus uh, uh, an employee, um, sure. so you know. So we would have to ask you the same sort of questions we asked Earl earlier. So... You said you're sitting at your computer most of the time. Are you, are you deciding when you're doing the casting calls and when you're not as far as what hours you work during the day and when you take breaks and all of that? It's a variety of things, right? Because we have um, both, I work at my desk, but like looking through and then also I'll get together with the clients and we will have a Zoom session that is, you know, a decided upon time right that we all have to show up to zoom including the actor okay and then um who's i guess writing the questions or determining what the standards are for what you're looking for when you are um meeting with people to figure out who the cast is going to be i i think it's them i mean you know i i certainly have a decent amount of input but i'm not the decider and then um i mean so so far it sounds like you could be either way um because you have your own company that's something that i think john mentioned you know earlier is one of the factors he looks for from the employer's perspective if you're contracting um, as a company rather than you as an individual, that, that I mean, that's one of the factors. It's not necessarily determining, but it is something that's looked at. It sounds like the equipment is your equipment, your own, you know, computer that you're working with. Um, but at the same time, it sounds like the work that you're doing is being directed by who you're contracting with. Um, how often do you work for the same company? It all depends. You know, I'm working with a filmmaker now doing a union shoot in Albuquerque. Um, I'm not union, right? So, and and I'm just get, getting paid a flat rate and it's the third movie I've done with this person in one year, maybe. So there's that. And then additionally, I do commercials here, there, and yonder. Um, generally speaking, for a flat fee, you know, you know, we do it as a, you know, I can, I can do that casting in this many days for this many dollars. <laughs> it's the price is right of casting. <laughs> yes. I mean, so, so to me, it, it sounds like you could be an independent contractor or you're really close on the line. I think we would need to, you know, ask more questions and find out more information about all those details. But, um, you're not like as clear of an employee as the circumstances that that Earl said. So right, yeah. right, right. I and think I, that you know, keep having whatever conversations you're you're having with the people you know doing the same work. Um, but do know that in California, the laws there, as far as the state laws, are more um, you know, tend to lean towards finding someone as an employee versus an independent contractor than the laws we have in Florida. Um, of course, that's different for, you know, the IRS because it's federal and DOL and all that. Um, but definitely keep having the conversations that you're having with people um, to try to, you know, figure out more about what you might be. But you're definitely like either close to that line or maybe you're an independent contractor. Right. Okay. Does All right. That Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Just, real quick, Ross. Real, real quick. Does that make a difference in how to um, litigate? I, I like. Do you call the labor board or things like that to to get money that is owed you and not coming? 
Yeah, so the difference would be if, if you were an employee, then you could go, you know, open all kinds of cans of worms of, you know, getting paid the proper wages and filing um, federal or state lawsuits related to being improperly paid um, wages and other things. Um, and But then if you're an independent contractor, whatever your contract says as to what the governing law is, in, in the court, sometimes it has that language in there. Um, you'd have to go to a likely a state court, potentially federal court, depending on how much money you're you're really owed and where your employee the, the company is and all that. Um, but it would be a, a lawsuit under the contract versus opening up all the employee issues. Complicated. Thank you. Yes. All right. Sure. Thanks, Rose. All right. So we got uh, time for just a couple. Rich Rodman, I got your message. So I am going to spotlight you. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, my accountants are going to really enjoy the information I'm trying to get here. Um, I work uh, primarily also as a DIT where um, I get both uh, W-2s and 1099. Um, the variety of films I do... Um, uh, independent movies, which I end up getting paid through a payroll service where I get W-2s from. Um, and then I do a lot of uh, commercial work, which tends to be more uh, contractor, but they also tend to have been using more payroll services now and I get W-2s from there. But for each of those same jobs, I get a, 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 a 1099 because of my equipment. I bring uh, my own computer systems, my own monitors, a whole variety of stuff that I need to provide to be able to do my job. And then half the time, I'm actually not even with the crew. I'm set up either on my own location or an offset location to be able to handle the dailies and the material that I need to do to provide the services that I'm providing. So my accountant always is never sure where I intend to fall in a lot of these things. And, you know, she's always wondering how the IRS reads getting, you know, W-2s and 1099s for the same work that we're calling for. So... How do you see that fall into uh, what we were talking today when you were saying, you know, you keep asking, are you getting a W-2 or a 1099? And the answer to my is I get both. Okay, this one, I'm also answering a question online here. Let me just finish this. The question online, just real quick, is which law decides, the state or the federal? And the law that decides is whichever one is more beneficial to the worker. Um, so I'll finish that in a moment. So Rich, great question. So for for the last uh, for, for most of my career, you um, never you never wanted to have a W two and a ten ninety nine miscellaneous to the same person. If I did more than five of those in a year as a company, it's an audit flag in the IRS audit system. A few years ago, because of the conflict. Uh, between employee compensation being required to be reported to the IRS on or before January 31st and box rental, you can go all the way to February 28th. The IRS split the form a couple of years ago into a 1099 NEC due on January 31st with that non-employee compensation amount in it and the box rental due on February 28th uh, on a 1099 miscellaneous in box two. So that that separation is, is a, was a big deal for the motion picture and television industry. Of course, we all knew at Entertainment Partners, if we wait to give you guys a 1099 a miscellaneous on February 28th, you will not be happy and you will let us know. So most people don't realize there's a deadline difference because we shove them out all by the 31st. So that means um, now for you, uh, well, historically, when you worked as an employee at Entertainment Partners, um, you would get that W-2 as an employee and then you would get that 1099 miscellaneous but we would not put your box rental in non-employee compensation. We put it in box three, box rental. And that's why you never had an IRS problem because that matching program doesn't pick up box three. You've never had that problem. And nobody in the industry ever had the problem. 
Now those two are separated. Now your CPA, potentially based on the way you work, you're going to get the W-2, 10 to 9 S N E C for those smaller productions that are hiring you and saying, for just like Earl talked about, oh, you're an you're a contractor. And then you'll get for all of the box rental that you may not even be on the set with, you'll get that that 10 to 9 miscellaneous with, with the box rental box in it. So because the IRS, because that split happened during the pandemic. And they had to, it, you know, they did not just have an aircraft carrier when this changed. They had an entire naval fleet that they had to shift. And at the same time, they had to implement the affordable, the um, the ERC and the PPP. Mm -hmm. So their their systems are stressed. So for the next, they, they really haven't started that true matching program yet. But they're they're gaining sophistication with AI, so uh, there will be a time when compliance will catch up, and that's why I mentioned to Earl, um, hold on to that paperwork, document everything, um, and try not to be bitter, <laughs> because when it is going to be compliance that catches that um, that com the the commercial producers and and the indies. Compliance will come for them because the IRS is going to use, be able to use AI and be more sophisticated um, and make tremendous leap forwards. And when they do, they'll run those matching programs and they're going to be sophisticated enough to not, not just go after the poor person who didn't have a choice and was stuck. They're going to look at that federal ID number and they're going to match that and they're going to go back to the employer first. That's just my, that's, and uh, that's just my, uh, and I, I just, so you know, I worked on an IRS commission for four years um, uh, and um, flew back and, and physically was sat with them and helped implement the Affordable Care Act. I know exactly what they're dealing with and I'm still very close to, to them uh, throughout the, the ERC, helped them implement that. So I know a lot about what's happening with their systems. They're just not caught up yet and don't quote me. <laughs> <laughs> but but they will that that mm -hmm. that time is coming and the documentation that you keep will be super 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 important uh, because there's there's um and, and i can't stress enough try not to be bitter in the end compliance comes it'll come yeah good to know keep in all the documents all right yeah just keep everything most people don't right mm -hmm. uh, do it um, all right thank you Thank you, Rich. Uh, I have one quick question and then Chris, we're gonna go to you. We only have time for one more from the audience. Um, something I saw in the chat, what is the purpose of a probationary period for employment when an employer, for the employer, when the employee can still claim unemployment if they are terminated within 90 days of that probationary period? I think that's probably a John or an Aaron question. I'll take it. Uh, in go for Florida, it. A probationary period of employment is what the employer decides uh, how long the employee uh, will it will take for the employee to attain regular employee status. If the employee doesn't uh, work out through no fault of their own, they're just not qualified for the job and they leave within 90 days, they can claim unemployment and get unemployment. But if the employer has set up it's paperwork properly, the employer's unemployment comp tax account will not be charged because they took the chance on hiring an employee, it just didn't work out. So probationary period doesn't disqualify the employee from getting unemployment as long as it's no longer 90 days and they're terminated for job performance. Got it. Okay. Uh, Chris, I am going to spotlight you as our last question from the audience. Go ahead and unmute, unmute and ask your question. Uh, I'll try to be real quick, but it caught my attention. I think it was Becky was talking about uh, workers' comp. Um, what really, really concerns me more than anything else are the small commercials, the one or two day things where the crew shows up. And we're not talking heads of department. We're talking the grunts. You know, everybody shows up. And all of a sudden they realize, okay, I'm working under a 1099. 
And, you know, whether or not they're aware, they have no protection if they get hurt. And we're in a very dangerous industry, as we all know. So somebody gets hurt on a one day commercial, um, you know, falls down, breaks and shatters an ankle, won't be able to work for six months and is not covered by workers comp because they're not doing that. He's a 1099 and his own insurance won't cover it because he's gotten hurt on a work site and he's up the proverbial, you know what, creek. Um, Becky had said that there is, you know, the production company itself does have workers comp. Is there recourse after the fact, particularly if you know you're never going to work for these jerks again and you don't care about the relationship? Can you press the case that, hey, here I am, I got hurt on their job and I need medical coverage. Can you press it? And, and by the way, I have all the documentation because that's what Becky told me to do. So um, they should have general liability coverage and the general liability coverage should cover that injury. What it doesn't cover, that it would cover the medical part of that injury. Where the worker is at a loss is the financial um, paycheck that they won't be getting while they're recovering. That's that's the workers' comp coverage part that that's missing for them. So their medical general liability coverage, medical would be covered more than likely on that shoot, but the the worker themselves would not have access to um, a payment, a subsistence payment, uh, while they recover, so they can cover their bills, and that's the issue. So. Okay. Um, so the question then is, can they go after them? The, the first place I would send that person would be the Department of Labor um, and with their documents, uh, because then the Department of Labor would get involved and um, on behalf of the employee. And if the, the production was found that it was an employer-employee relationship, then, um, then the employer themselves, although they didn't have workers' comp coverage, would be liable for the equivalent of workers' comp coverage but this is a state-run um, uh, program. Workers' Comp is not national, so every state is different. And I'm California-based, so I'm stronger on the California side. So someone on the line may be able to speak a little bit more to Florida's Workers' Comp coverage and whether or not um, the concepts I've just talked about would prevail in the DOL of Florida. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the other thing, Chris, is... Hi, by the way. Um, I think that the other thing is the individual should go to a workers' comp attorney and go through with that workers' comp attorney with how they think that they're an employee, um, mm -hmm. because a lot of times the workers' comp attorneys for the first session will meet with you for free. Um, often they'll also take a case on contingency, which means they only receive a portion if you're either successful at workers' comp in a hearing or, um, you know, where you get a judgment or if you settle the case, there'll be a portion they take. So that that's often how workers' comp works. Maybe not always, but it's often how it does. So definitely talk to a workers' comp attorney about the circumstances. Um, and I think, you know, going to the DOL is always a great idea, too, to see if there's um, something more that can be done if, if you really think that individual is an employee. Um, but definitely start the workers' comp route because you only have so long. I don't actually know what it is in Florida. I practice in Wisconsin and in Massachusetts. I could tell you um, everything as to the timing and everything. Florida, I'm not sure what it is, but there is some sort of a deadline for when you can file a claim. So you want to meet with a workers' comp attorney as soon as possible to go through those things. Those are great answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna give each of our panelists kind of one last uh, shot to yeah, any parting shots. So uh, Becky, why don't you go first? You, you've heard my running theme, keep documentation on everything you possibly can. Um, if you're keeping it electronically, have a backup. Perfect, John? If it comes down to, which is it, employer, employee or independent contractor. If you want to err on the side of caution, it's an employer-employee relationship uh, more times than not. Perfect, and Aaron. I think you all know what I'd say. Um, 
talk to a union. Talk to a union <laughs> about what you're doing um because they can help try to get the resources for you as to what you need um and 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 like becky said earlier they're gonna want you to be employees because they're gonna want you to get all the benefits you can get as an employee um so that is true that side will be there but um they will definitely help you and that's the better way to go than trying to talk to the company that might you know start getting concerned of you asking certain questions right right well, that's going to wrap up another edition of Film Florida Friday. Thanks to John, Aaron, and Becky for being with us. Thanks to all of you for joining us. And of course, as I mentioned, thanks to Earl for suggesting this topic. As always, thanks to Katie Collins for helping me wrangle and prepare for Film Florida Friday each month. We're going to be back next month with another edition of Film Florida Friday, where we're talking with an old friend about AR and VR. Uh, be on the lookout for that info in email blast and on our social media pages. As always, thanks to all of our Film Florida members for their continued support. If you're not a member of Film Florida, we hope you'll consider joining at filmflorida.org. Keep up with everything we're doing on our social media pages. Make sure you check out the Film Florida podcast, which is available on most major podcast networks. Make sure you sub subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Thanks again for being here, everybody. Stay safe out there. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.